Hello there, and welcome to this softly spoken reading of The Secret Garden, with relaxing rain sounds in the background to help you get down to sleep. Sorry that it's been a little bit longer than usual between uploads here on the main channel, as I've been getting the second channel, Down to Sleep Extra, up and running. That's where I'm slowly getting all of the books that were taken down from this channel back up over there, so if you want to hear Twilight, Coraline, and other books, Down to Sleep Extra, the second channel, is the place to go. But if you want to hear everything first, including the exclusive books like Howl's Moving Castle, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and more, then the Patreon is the best place to listen to this podcast and to support it at patreon.com slash down to sleep. Find all the links you need below this video, including the Instagram for the podcast, where I update you on what's going on behind the scenes and post every time I put up a new video. But for now, let's go ahead and tuck you in. Take a nice deep breath for me, and let's get down to sleep. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Bennett. It was the sweetest, most mysterious looking place anyone could imagine. The high walls which shut it in were covered with the leafless stems of climbing roses, which were so thick that they were matted together. Mary Lennox knew they were roses, because she had seen a great many roses in India. All the ground was covered with grass of a wintry brown, and out of it grew clumps of bushes, which were surely rose bushes if they were alive. There were numbers of standard roses which had so spread their branches that they were like little trees. There were other trees in the garden and one of the things which made the place look strangest and loveliest was that climbing roses had run all over them and swung down long tendrils which made light swaying curtains, and here and there they had caught at each other or at a far-reaching branch and had crept from one tree to another and made lovely bridges of themselves. There were neither leaves nor roses on them now, and Mary did not know whether they were dead or alive. But their thin grey or brown branches and sprays looked like a sort of hazy mantle spreading over everything. Walls and trees and even brown grass where they had fallen from their fastenings and run along the ground. It was this hazy tangle from tree to tree which made it all look so mysterious. Mary had thought it must be different from other gardens which had not been left all by themselves so long, and indeed it was different from any other place she had ever seen in her life. How still it is, she whispered. How still. Then she waited a moment and listened at the stillness. The robin who had flown to his treetop was still as all the rest. He did not even flutter his wings. He sat without stirring and looked at Mary. No wonder it is still, she whispered again. I am the first person who has spoken in here for ten years. She moved away from the door, stepping as softly as if she were afraid of awakening someone. She was glad that there was grass under her feet and that her steps made no sounds. She walked under one of the fairy-like grey arches between the trees, and looked up at the sprays and tendrils which formed them. I wonder if they are all quite dead, she said. Is it all a quite dead garden? I wish it wasn't. If she had been Ben Weatherstaff, she could have told whether the wood was alive by looking at it, but she could only see that there were only grey or brown sprays and branches, and none showed any signs of even a tiny leaf bud anywhere. But she was inside the wonderful garden, and she could come through the door under the ivy any time, and she felt as if she had found a world all her own. The sun was shining inside the four walls, and the high arch of blue sky over this particular piece of Mistlethwaite seemed even more brilliant and soft than it was over the moor. 
the robin flew down from his treetop and hopped about or flew after her from one bush to another. He chirped a good deal and had a very busy air, as if he was showing her things. Everything was strange and silent, and she seemed to be hundreds of miles away from anyone. But somehow, she did not feel lonely at all. All that troubled her was her wish that she knew whether all the roses were dead, or if perhaps some of them had lived, and might put out leaves and buds as the weather got warmer. She did not want it to be a quite dead garden. If it were a quite alive garden, how wonderful it would be, and what thousands of roses would grow on every side. Her skipping rope had hung over her arm when she came in, and after she walked about for a while, she thought she would skip round the whole garden, stopping when she wanted to look at things. There seemed to have been grass paths here and there, and in one or two corners there were alcoves of evergreen, with stone seats or tall moss-covered flower urns in them. As she came near the second of these alcoves, she stopped skipping. There had once been a flower bed in it, and she thought she saw something sticking out of the black earth. Some sharp little pale green points. She remembered what Ben Weatherstaff had said and she knelt down to look at them. Yes, they are tiny growing things. They might be crocuses or snowdrops or daffodils, she whispered. She bent very close to them and sniffed the fresh scent of the damp earth. She liked it very much. Perhaps there are some other ones coming up in other places, she said. I will go all over the garden and look. She did not skip, but walked. She bent slowly and kept her eyes on the ground. She looked in the old border beds and among the grass. And after she had gone round, trying to miss nothing, she had found ever so many more sharp pale green points, and she had become quite excited again. It isn't a quite dead garden. She cried out softly to herself. Even if the roses are dead, there are other things alive. She did not know anything about gardening. But the grass seemed so thick in some of the places where the green points were pushing their way through that she thought they did not seem to have room enough to grow. She searched about until she found a rather sharp piece of wood and knelt down and dug and weeded out the weeds and grass until she made nice little clear places around them. Now they look as if they could breathe, she said, after she had finished with the first ones. I am going to do ever so many more. I'll do all I can see. If I haven't time today, I can come tomorrow. She went from place to place and dug and weeded and enjoyed herself so immensely that she was led on from bed to bed into the grass under the trees. The exercise made her so warm that she first threw her coat off and then her hat, and without knowing it she was smiling down onto the grass and the pale green points all the time. The robin was tremendously busy. He was very much pleased to see gardening begun on his own estate. He had often wondered at Ben Weatherstaff, where gardening is done. All sorts of delightful things to eat are turned up with the soil. Now here was this new kind of creature, who was not half Ben's size, and yet had had the sense to come into his garden and begin at once. Mistress Mary worked in her garden until it was time to go to her midday dinner. In fact, she was rather late in remembering, and when she put on her coat and hat and picked up her skipping rope, she could not believe that she had been working two or three hours. 
she had been actually happy all the time, and dozens and dozens of the tiny pale green points were to be seen in cleared places, looking twice as cheerful as they had looked before, when the grass and weeds had been smothering them. I shall come back this afternoon, she said, looking all round at her new kingdom, speaking to the trees and the rose bushes as if they heard her. Then she ran lightly across the grass, pushed open the slow old door and slipped through it under the ivy. She had such red cheeks and such bright eyes and ate such a dinner that Martha was delighted. Two pieces of meat and two helps of rice pudding, she said. Mother will be pleased when I tell her what skipping rope's done for thee. In the course of her digging with her pointed stick, Mistress Mary had found herself digging up a sort of white root, rather like an onion. She had put it back in its place and patted the earth carefully down on it. And just now, she wondered if Martha could tell her what it was. Martha, she said, what are those white roots that look like onions? They're bulbs, answered Martha. Lots of spring flowers grow from them. Very little ones are snowdrops and crocuses, and the big ones are narcissuses and jonquils and daffodowndillies. The biggest of all is lilies and purple flags. Eh, they're nice. Dickon's got a whole lot of them planted in our bit of garden. Does Dickon know all about them? asked Mary, a new idea taking possession of her. Our Dickon can make a flower grow out of a brick walk. Mother says he just whispers things out the ground. Do bulbs live a long time? Would they live years and years if no one helped them? Inquired Mary anxiously. They're things as helps themselves, said Martha. That's why poor folk can afford to have them. If you don't trouble them, most of them will work away underground for lifetime and spread out and have little ones. There's a place in the park woods here where there's snowdrops by thousands. They're the prettiest sight in Yorkshire when the spring comes. No one knows when they were first planted. I wish the spring was here now, said Mary. I want to see all the things that grow in England. She had finished her dinner and gone to her favourite seat on the hearthrug. I wish... I wish I had a little spade, she said. Whatever does thou want a spade for? asked Martha, laughing. Art thou going to take to digging? I must tell mother that too. Mary looked at the fire and pondered a little. She must be careful if she meant to keep her secret kingdom. She wasn't doing any harm, but if Mr. Craven found out about the open door, he would be fearfully angry and get a new key and lock it up forevermore. She really could not bear that. This is such a big, lonely place, she said slowly as if she were turning matters over in her mind. The house is lonely, and the park is lonely, and the gardens are lonely. So many places seem shut up. I never did many things in India, but there were more people to look at, natives and soldiers marching by, and sometimes bands playing, and my ayah told me stories. There's no one to talk to here except you and Ben Weatherstaff. And you have to do your work, and Ben Weatherstaff won't speak to me often. I thought if I had a little spade I could dig somewhere as he does. I might make a little garden if he would give me some seeds. Martha's face quite lighted up. There now, she exclaimed. If that wasn't one of the things Mother said, she says... There's such a lot of room in that big place. Why don't they give her a bit for herself? Even if she doesn't plant nothing but parsley and radishes. She'd dig and rake away and be right down happy over it. Them's was the very words she said. Were they? said Mary. How many things she knows, doesn't she? Hey, said Martha. It's like she says. 
A woman as brings up 12 children learns something besides her ABC. Children's as good as arithmetic to set you finding out things. How much would a spade cost? A little one, Mary asked. Well, was Martha's reflective answer. At Thwaite Village, there's a shop or so, and I saw little garden sets with a spade and a rake and a fork all tied together for two shillings. And they were stout enough to work with, too. I've got more than that in my purse, said Mary. Mrs. Morrison gave me five shillings, and Mrs. Medlock gave me some money from Mr. Craven. Did he remember thee that much? exclaimed Martha. Mrs. Medlock said I have a shilling a week to spend. She gives me one every Saturday. I didn't know what to spend it on. My word, that's riches, said Martha. I can buy anything in the world I wants. The rent of our cottage is only on three pence, and it's like pulling eye teeth to get it. Now I've just thought of something, putting her hands on her hips. What? said Mary eagerly. In the shop at Thwaite, they sell packages of flower seeds for a penny each. And our Dickon, he knows which is the prettiest ones, how to make them grow. He walks over to Thwaite many a day just for the fun of it. Does thou know how to print letters? I know how to write, Mary answered. Martha shook her head. Our Dickon can only read printing. If that could print, we could write a letter to him, ask him to go and buy the garden tools and the seeds at the same time. Oh, you're a good girl, Mary cried. You are, really. I didn't know you were so nice. I know I can print letters if I try. Let's ask Mrs. Medlock for a pen and ink and some paper. I got some of my own, said Martha. I bought them so I could print a bit of a letter to Mother of a Sunday. I'll go get it. She ran out of the room, and Mary stood by the fire and twisted her thin little hands together with sheer pleasure. If I have a spade, she whispered, I can make the earth nice and soft and dig up weeds. If I have seeds and can make flowers grow, the garden won't be dead at all. It will come alive. She did not go out again that afternoon, because when Martha returned with her pen and ink and paper, she was obliged to clear the table and carry the plates and dishes downstairs. And when she got into the kitchen, Mrs. Medlock was there and told her to do something. So Mary waited for what seemed to her a long time before she came back. Then it was a serious piece of work to write to Dickon. Mary had been taught very little, because her governess had disliked her too much to stay with her. She could not spell particularly well, but she found that she could print letters when she tried. This was the letter Martha dictated to her. My dear Dickon, this comes hoping to find you well, as it leaves me at present. Miss Mary has plenty of money, and will you go to Thwaite and buy her some flower seeds and a set of garden tools to make a flower bed. Pick the prettiest ones, and easy to grow because she has never done it before and lived in India, which is different. Give my love to Mother, and every one of you. Miss Mary is going to tell me a lot more, so that on my next day out, you can hear about elephants and camels and gentlemen going hunting lions and tigers. Your loving sister, Martha Phoebe Sowerby. We'll put the money in the envelope and I'll get the butcher boy to take it in his cart. He's a great friend of Dickon's, said Martha. How shall I get the things when Dickon buys them? He'll bring them to you himself. You'll like to walk over this way. Oh, exclaimed Mary. Then I shall see him. I never thought I should see Dickon. Does thou want to see him? asked Martha suddenly, for Mary had looked so pleased. Yes, I do. I never saw a boy foxes and crows loved. I want to see him very much. Martha gave a little start, as if she remembered something. Now to think, she broke out, to think of me forgetting that there, and I thought I was going to tell you first thing this morning. I asked Mother, and she said she'd ask Mrs. Medlock her own self. 
Do you mean... Mary began. What I said Tuesday. I ask her if she might be driven over to our cottage some day and have a bit of mother's hot oat cake and butter in a glass of milk. It seemed as if all the interesting things were happening in one day. To think of going over the moor in the daylight and when the sky was blue. To think of going into the cottage which held twelve children. Does she think Mrs. Medlock would let me go? She asked quite anxiously. Aye, she thinks she would. She knows what a tidy woman mother is and how clean she keeps cottage. If I went, I should see your mother as well as Dickon, said Mary, thinking it over, liking the idea very much. She doesn't seem to be like the mothers in India. Her work in the garden and the excitement of the afternoon ended by making her feel quiet and thoughtful. Martha stayed with her until tea time, but they sat in comfortable quiet and talked very little. But just before Martha went downstairs for the tea tray, Mary asked a question. Martha, she said, has the scullery maid had the toothache again today? Martha certainly started slightly. What makes thee ask that? she said. Because when I waited so long for you to come back, I opened the door and walked down the corridor to see if you were coming. And I heard that far off crying again, just as we heard it the other night. There isn't a wind today, so you see it couldn't have been the wind. Eh, said Martha restlessly. Thou mustn't go walking about in corridors and listening. Mr. Craven would be that there angry. There's no knowing what he'd do. I wasn't listening, said Mary. I was just waiting for you, and I heard it. That's three times. My word, uh, there's Mrs. Medlock's bell, said Martha, and she almost ran out of the room. It's the strangest house anyone ever lived in, said Mary drowsily, as she dropped her head on the cushioned seat of the armchair near her. Fresh air and digging and skipping rope had made her feel so comfortably tired that she fell asleep. The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she had thought must be rather stupid. She had no intention of going to sleep, and in fact, she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. She was beginning to like to be out of doors. She no longer hated the wind, but enjoyed it. She could run faster and longer and she could skip up to a hundred. The bulbs in the secret garden must have been astonished. Such nice clear places were made round them that they had all the breathing space they wanted. And really, if Mistress Mary had known it, they began to cheer up under the dark earth and work tremendously. The sun could get at them and warm them and when the rain came down, it could reach them at once. So they began to feel very much alive. Mary was an odd, determined little person. And now she had something interesting to be determined about. She was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily only becoming more pleased with her work every hour instead of tiring of it. 
It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points than she had ever hoped to find. They seemed to be starting up everywhere, and each day she was sure she found tiny new ones. Some so tiny that they barely peeped above the earth. There were so many that she remembered what Martha had said about the snowdrops by the thousands, and about bulbs spreading and making new ones. These had been left to themselves for ten years, and perhaps they had spread, like the snowdrops, into thousands. She wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden and try to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. During that week of sunshine, she became more intimate with Ben Weatherstaff. She surprised him several times by seeming to start up beside him as if she sprang out of the earth. The truth was that she was afraid that he would pick up his tools and go away if he saw her coming. So she always walked toward him as silently as possible. But in fact, he did not object to her as strongly as he had at first. Perhaps he was secretly rather flattered by her evident desire for his elderly company. Then, also, she was more civil than she had been. He did not know that when she first saw him, she spoke to him as she would have spoken to a native, and had not known that a cross, sturdy old Yorkshire man was not accustomed to salaam to his masters and be merely commanded by them to do things. Ah, like the robin, he said to her one morning when he lifted his head, and saw her standing by him. I never knows when I shall see thee or which side thou'll come from. He's friends with me now, said Mary. That's like him, snapped Ben Weatherstaff, making up to the women folk just for vanity and flightiness. There's nothing he wouldn't do for the sake of showing off and flirting his tail feathers. He's as full of pride as an egg's full of meat. He very seldom talked much, and sometimes did not even answer Mary's questions except by a grunt. But this morning, he said more than usual. He stood up and rested one hobnailed boot on the top of his spade while he looked her over. How long's thou been here? he jerked out. I think it's about a month, she answered. Thou's beginning to do Misselthwaite credit, he said. Thou's a bit fatter than thou was. And that's not quite so yellow. Thou's looked quite young plucked crow when the first come into garden. Thinks I to myself I never set eyes on an uglier, sourer faced young un. Mary was not vain, as she had never thought much of her looks. She was not greatly disturbed. I know I'm fatter, she said. My stockings are getting tighter. They used to make wrinkles. There's the robin, Ben Weatherstaff. There indeed was the robin, and she thought he looked nicer than ever. His red waistcoat was as glossy as satin, and he flirted his wings and tail and tilted his head, and hopped about with all sorts of lively graces. He seemed determined to make Ben Weatherstaff admire him, but Ben was sarcastic. Aye, there they are, he said. That I can put up with me for a bit sometimes when I's got no one better. Thou has been reddening up thy waistcoat and polishing thy feathers this two weeks. I know what thou's up to. Thou has caught in some bold young madam somewhere, telling thy lies to her about being the finest cock robin on Mistlemoor, and ready to fight all the rest of them. Oh, look at him, exclaimed Mary. The robin was evidently in a fascinating, bold mood. He hopped closer and closer, and looked at Ben Weatherstaff more and more engagingly. He flew on to the nearest currant bush, and tilted his head, 
and sang a little song right at him. Tha thinks that'll get me over by doing that, said Ben, wrinkling his face up in such a way that Mary felt sure he was trying not to look pleased. Tha thinks no one can stand out against thee. That's what tha thinks. The robin spread his wings. Mary could scarcely believe her eyes. He flew right up to the handle of Ben Weatherstaff's spade and alighted on the top of it. Then the old man's face wrinkled itself slowly into a new expression. He stood still as if he were afraid to breathe, as if he would not have stirred for the world, lest his robin should start away. He spoke quite in a whisper. Well, I'm danged, he said as softly as if he were saying something quite different. Tha does know how to get at a chap, tha does. Tha's fair unearthly, tha's so knowing. And he stood without stirring, almost without drawing his breath, until the robin gave another flirt to his wings and flew away. Then he stood looking at the handle of the spade, as if there might be magic in it. And then he began to dig again, and said nothing for several minutes. But because he kept breaking into a slow grin now and then, Mary was not afraid to talk to him. Have you a garden of your own? she asked. No, I'm bachelor and lodge with Martin at the gate. If you had one, said Mary, what would you plant? Cabbages, tears and onions. But if you wanted to make a flower garden, persisted Mary, what would you plant? Bulbs sweet-smelling things, but mostly roses. Mary's face lighted up. Do you like roses? she said. Ben Weatherstaff rooted up a weed and threw it aside before he answered. Well, yes I do. I was learned that by a young lady I was gardener to. She had a lot in a place that she was fond of, and she loved them like they was children, or robins. I've seen her bend over and kiss him. He dragged out another weed and scowled at it. That were as much as ten year ago. Where is she now? asked Mary, much interested. Heaven, he answered, and drove his spade deep into the soil, according to what Parson says. What happened to the roses? Mary asked again more interested than ever. They was left to themselves. Mary was becoming quite excited. Did they quite die? Do roses quite die when they're left to themselves? She ventured. Well, I'd got to like them. And I liked her. And she liked them. Ben Weatherstaff admitted reluctantly. Once or twice a year I'd go and work on them a bit prune them and dig about the roots. They run wild, but it was in rich soil, so some of them lived. When they have no leaves, and look grey and brown and dry, how can you tell whether they're dead or alive? inquired Mary. Wait till spring gets at them. Wait till the sun shines on the rain, and the rain falls on the sunshine, and then they'll find out. How? How? cried Mary, forgetting to be careful. Look along the twigs and branches, and if thou see a bit of brown lump swelling here and there, watch it after the warm rain and see what happens. He stopped suddenly and looked curiously at her eager face. Why dost thou care so much about roses and such all of a sudden? he demanded. Mistress Mary felt her face grow red. She was almost afraid to answer. I... I want to play that... that I have a garden of my own, she stammered. There is nothing for me to do. I have nothing, and 
No one. Well, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly, as he watched her. That's true. That hasn't. He said it in such an odd way that Mary wondered if he was actually a little sorry for her. She had never felt sorry for herself. She had only felt tired and cross because she disliked people and things so much. But now the world seemed to be changing and getting nicer. If no one found out about the secret garden, she should enjoy herself always. She stayed with him for ten or fifteen minutes longer and asked him as many questions as she dared. He answered every one of them in his queer, grunting way, and he did not seem really cross and did not pick up his spade and leave her. He said something about roses just as she was going away, and it reminded her of the ones he had said he had been fond of. Do you go and see those other roses now? she asked. Not been this year. My rheumatics has made me too stiff in joints. He said it in his grumbling voice, and then quite suddenly he seemed to get angry with her, though she did not see why he should. Now look here, he said sharply. Does that ask so many questions? Thou art the worst wench for asking questions I've ever come across. Get thee gone and play thee. I've done talking for today. And he said it so crossly that she knew there was not the least use in staying another minute. She went skipping slowly down the outside walk, thinking him over and saying to herself that, queer as it was, here was another person whom she liked in spite of his crossness. She liked old Ben Weatherstaff. Yes, she did like him. She always wanted to try to make him talk to her. Also, she began to believe that he knew everything in the world about flowers. There was a laurel-hedged walk which curved round the secret garden and ended at a gate which opened into a wood in the park. She thought she would slip round this walk and look into the wood and see if there were any rabbits hopping about. She enjoyed the skipping very much, and when she reached the little gate, she opened it and went through because she heard a low, peculiar whistling sound and wanted to find out what it was. It was a very strange thing indeed. She quite caught her breath as she stopped to look at it. A boy was sitting under a tree, with his back against it, playing on a rough wooden pipe. He was a funny looking boy, about twelve. He looked very clean, and his nose turned up and his cheeks were as red as poppies and Never had Mistress Mary seen such round and such blue eyes in any boy's face. And on the trunk of the tree he leaned against, a brown squirrel was clinging and watching him. And from behind a bush nearby, a cock pheasant was delicately stretching his neck to peep out. And quite near him were two rabbits sitting up and sniffing with tremulous noses. And actually, it appeared as if they were all drawing near to watch him and listen to the strange low little call his pipe seemed to make. When he saw Mary, he held up his hand and spoke to her in a voice almost as low as and rather like his piping. Don't thou move, he said. It'd fight him. Mary remained motionless. He stopped playing his pipe and began to rise from the ground. He moved so slowly that it scarcely seemed as though he were moving at all. But at last he stood on his feet 
and then the squirrel scampered back up into the branches of the tree. The pheasant withdrew his head, and the rabbits dropped on all fours and began to hop away, though not at all as if they were frightened. I'm Dickon, the boy said. I know that, Miss Mary. Then Mary realized that somehow she had known at first that he was Dickon. Who else could have been charming rabbits and pheasants as the natives charm snakes in India? He had a wide, red, curving mouth, and his smile spread all over his face. I got up slow, he explained, because if the arm makes a quick move, it startles him. A body has to move gentle and speak low when wild things is about. He did not speak to her as if they had never seen each other before, but as if he knew her quite well. Mary knew nothing about boys, and she spoke to him a little stiffly because she felt rather shy. Did you get Martha's letter? she asked. He nodded his curly, rust-coloured head. That's why I come. He stooped to pick up something which had been lying on the ground beside him when he piped. I've got the garden tools. There's a little spade and rake and fork and hoe. Eh? Hey, they're good uns. There's a trowel too. And the woman in the shop threw in a packet of white poppy and one of blue larkspur when I bought the other seeds. Will you show the seeds to me? Mary said. She wished she could talk as he did. His speech was so quick and easy. It sounded as if he liked her, and was not the least afraid she would not like him, though he was only a common moor boy. In patched clothes, and with a funny face, and a rough, rusty red head. As she came closer to him, she noticed that there was a clean, fresh scent of heather, and grass, and leaves about him, almost as if he were made of them. She liked it very much, and when she looked into his funny face with the red cheeks and round blue eyes, she forgot that she had felt shy. Let us sit down on this log and look at them, she said. They sat down, and he took a clumsy little brown paper package out of his coat pocket. He untied the string, and inside there were ever so many neater and smaller packages with a picture of a flower on each one. There's a lot of mignonettes and poppies, he said. Mignonettes, the sweetest smelling things as grows, and it'll grow wherever you cast it, same as poppies will. Them as'll come up and bloom if you just whistle to them. Them's the nicest of all. He stopped and turned his head quickly, his poppy-cheeked face lighting up. Where's that robin as is calling us, he said. The chirp came from a thick holly bush, bright with scarlet berries, and Mary thought she knew whose it was. Is it really calling us? she asked. Aye, said Dickon, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. He's calling someone he's friends with. That's same as saying, here I am, look at me, I want a bit of a chat. There he is in bush. Whose is he? He's Ben Weatherstaff's, but I think he knows me a little, answered Mary. Aye, he knows thee, said Dickon in his low voice again, and he likes thee. He's took thee on. He'll tell me all about thee in a minute. He moved quite close to the bush, with the slow movement Mary had noticed before. Then he made a sound, almost like the robin's own twitter. The robin listened a few seconds, intently, and then answered quite as if he were replying to a question. Hi, he's a friend of yours, chuckled Dickon. Do you think he is? cried Mary eagerly. She did so want to know. Do you think he really likes me? He wouldn't come near thee if he did. Birds is rare choosers, and a robin can flout a body worse than a man. See, he's making up to thee now. Cannot thou see a chap he's saying? And it really seemed as if it must be true. 
Giso sidled and twittered and tilted as he hopped on his bush. Do you understand everything birds say? said Mary. Dickon's grin spread until he seemed all wide red curving mouth, and he rubbed his rough head. I think I do, and they think I do, he said. I've lived on the moor with them so long. I've watched them break shell and come out and fledge and learn to fly and begin to sing, till I think I'm one of them. Sometimes I think perhaps I'm a bird, or a fox, or a rabbit, or a squirrel, or a fox, or even a beetle, and I don't know it. He laughed and came back to the log and began to talk about the flower seeds again. He told her what they looked like when they were flowers. He told her how to plant them and watch them and feed and water them. See here, he said suddenly, turning round to look at her. I'll plant them for thee myself. Where is thy garden? Mary's thin hands clutched each other as they lay on her lap. She did not know what to say, so for a whole minute she said nothing. She had never thought of this. She felt miserable, and she felt as if she went red, and then pale. Thar's got a bit of garden, hasn't thou? Dickon said. It was true that she had turned red and then pale. Dickon saw her do it, and as she still said nothing, he began to be puzzled. Wouldn't they give thee a bit? he asked. Hasn't thou got any yet? She held her hands tighter and turned her eyes toward him. I don't know anything about boys, she said slowly. Could you keep a secret if I told you one? It's a great secret. I don't know what I should do if anyone found it out. I believe I should die. She said the last sentence quite fiercely. Dickon looked more puzzled than ever, and rubbed his hand over his rough head again, but he answered quite good-humouredly. I'm keeping secrets all the time, he said. If I couldn't keep secrets from the other lads, secrets about foxes' cubs and birds' nests and wild things' holes, they'd be not safe on the moor. Aye, I can keep secrets. Mistress Mary did not mean to put out her hand and clutch his sleeve, but she did it. I've stolen a garden, she said very fast. It isn't mine. It isn't anybody's. Nobody wants it. Nobody cares for it. Nobody ever goes into it. Perhaps everything is dead in it already. I don't know. She began to feel hot and as contrary as she had ever felt in her life. I don't care. I don't care. Nobody has any right to take it from me when I care about it and they don't. They're letting it die, all shut in by itself. She ended passionately, and she threw her arms over her face and burst out crying. Poor little Mistress Mary. Dickens' curious blue eyes grew rounder and rounder. Hey, he said, drawing his exclamation out slowly. The way he did it meant both wonder and sympathy. I've nothing to do, said Mary. Nothing belongs to me. I found it myself and I got into it myself. I was only just like the robin, and they wouldn't take it from the robin. Where is it? asked Dickon in a dropped voice. Mistress Mary got up from the log at once. She knew she felt contrary again, and obstinate, and she did not care at all. She was imperious and Indian, and at the same time hot and sorrowful. Come with me, and I'll show you, she said. She led him round the laurel path, and to the walk where the ivy grew so thickly. Dickon followed her with a queer, almost pitying look on his face. 
He felt as if he were being led to look at some strange bird's nest and must move softly. When she stepped to the wall and lifted the hanging ivy, he started. There was a door, and Mary pushed it slowly open and they passed in together. And then Mary stood and waved her hand round defiantly. It's this, she said. It's a secret garden, and I'm the only one in the world who wants it to be alive. Dickon looked round and round about it, and round and round again. Hey, he almost whispered. It is a queer, pretty place. It's like as if a body was in a dream. For two or three minutes he stood looking round him, while Mary watched him, and then he began to walk about softly, even more lightly than Mary had walked the first time she had found herself inside the four walls. His eyes seemed to be taking in everything. The grey trees, with the grey creepers climbing over them, hanging from their branches, tangle on the walls and among the grass, the evergreen alcoves with the stone seats and tall flower urns standing in them. Never thought I'd see this place, he said at last in a whisper. Did you know about it? asked Mary. She had spoken aloud and he made a sign to her. We must talk low, he said, or someone will hear us. I wonder what's to do in here. Oh, I forgot, said Mary, feeling frightened and putting her hand quickly against her mouth. Did you know about the garden? She asked again when she had recovered herself. Dickon nodded. Martha told me there was one, as no one ever went inside. Boss used to wonder what it was like. He stopped and looked round at the lovely grey tangle about him, and his round eyes looked queerly happy. Eh, the nests as'll be here come springtime. It'd be the safest nesting place in England. No one never come in near in tangles and trees and roses to build in. I wonder all the birds on the moor don't build here. Mistress Mary put her hand on his arm again without knowing it. Will there be roses? she whispered. Can you tell? I thought perhaps they were all dead. Eh, hey, no, not them. Not all of them, he answered. Look here. He stepped over to the nearest tree. An old, old one, with grey lichen all over its bark, but upholding a curtain of tangled sprays and branches. He took a thick knife out of his pocket and opened one of its blades. There's lots of dead wood as ought to be cut out, he said. And there's lots of old wood, but it made some new last year. This here's a new bit. And he touched a shoot which looked brownish green instead of hard dry grey. Mary touched it herself in an eager, reverent way. That one, she said. Is that one quite alive, quite? Dickon curved his wide, smiling mouth. It's as wick as you or me, he said. And Mary remembered that Martha had told her that wick meant alive or lively. I'm glad it's wick, she cried out in her whisper. I want them all to be wick. Let us go round the garden and count how many wick ones there are. She quite panted with eagerness, and Dickon was as eager as she was. They went from tree to tree, and from bush to bush. Dickon carried his knife in his hand and showed her things which she thought were wonderful. They've run wild, he said, but the strongest ones as fair thrived on it. The delicatest ones has died out, 
but the others has growed and growed and spread and spread till there's a wonder. See here. And he pulled down a thick, grey, dry-looking branch. A body might think this was dead wood, but I don't believe it is. Down to the root. I'll cut it low down and see. He knelt, and with his knife cut the lifeless-looking branch, not far above the earth. There, he said exultantly, I told thee so. There's green in that wood yet. Look at it. Mary was down on her knees before he spoke, gazing with all her might. When it looks a bit greenish and juicy like that, it's wick, he explained. When the inside is dry and breaks easy, like this here piece I've cut off, it's done for. There's a big root here as all this live wood sprung out of. And if the old wood's cut off and it's dug round and took care of, there'll be... He stopped and lifted his face to look up at the climbing and hanging sprays above him. There'll be a fountain of roses here this summer. They went from bush to bush and from tree to tree. He was very strong and clever with his knife, and knew how to cut the dry and dead wood away, and could tell when an unpromising bough or twig had still green life in it. In the course of half an hour, Mary thought she could tell too, and when he cut through a lifeless looking branch she would cry out joyfully under her breath when she caught sight of the least shade of moist green. The spade and hoe and fork were very useful. He showed her how to use the fork while he dug about roots with the spade and stirred the earth to let the air in. They were working industriously round one of the biggest standard roses when he caught sight of something which made him utter an exclamation of surprise. Why? he cried, pointing to the grass a few feet away. Who did that there? It was one of Mary's own little clearings round the pale green points. I did it, said Mary. Why, I thought that I didn't know nothing about gardening, he exclaimed. I don't, she answered. But they were so little, and the grass was so thick and strong, and they looked as if they had no room to breathe. So I made a place for them. I, d I don't even know what they are. Dickon went and knelt down by them, smiling his wide smile. That I was right, he said. The gardener couldn't have told thee better. They'll grow now like Jack's beanstalk. They're crocuses and snowdrops, and these here is narcissuses, turning to another patch. And here's daffydown dillies. Hey, they'll be a sight. He ran from one clearing to another. Thou has done a lot of work for such a little wench, he said, looking her over. I'm growing fatter, said Mary, and I'm growing stronger. I used always to be tired. When I dig, I'm not tired at all. I like to smell the earth when it's turned up. It's rare good for thee, he said, nodding his head. There's not as nice as the smell of good clean earth, except the smell of fresh growing things when the rain falls on them. I get out on the moor many a day when it's raining and I lie under a bush and I listen to the soft swish of drops on the heather and I just sniff and sniff my nose end fair quivers like a rabbit's mother says. Do you never catch cold? inquired Mary, gazing at him wonderingly. She had never seen such a funny boy, or such a nice one. Not me, he said, grinning. I never catched cold since I was born. I wasn't brought up nesh enough. I've chased about the moor in all weathers, same as rabbits does. Mother says I've sniffed up too much fresh air for twelve years to ever get to sniffing with cold. 
I'm as tough as a white-thorn knobstick. He was working all the time he was talking, and Mary was following him and helping him with her fork or the trowel. There's a lot of work to do here, he said once, looking about quite exultantly. Will you come again and help me to do it? Mary begged. I'm sure I can help too. I can dig and pull up weeds and do whatever you tell me. Oh, do come, Dickon. I'll come every day if thou wants me. Rain or shine, he answered stoutly. It's the best fun I've ever had in my life. Shot in here and waking up a garden. If you will come, said Mary. If you will help me to make it alive, I'll... I don't know what I'll do, she ended helplessly. What could you do for a boy like that? I'll tell thee what thou'll do, said Dickon, with his happy grin. Thou'll get fat, and thou'll get hungry as a young fox, and thou'll learn how to talk to the robin same as I do. We'll have a lot of fun. He began to walk about, looking up in the trees and at the walls and bushes with a thoughtful expression. I wouldn't want to make it look like a gardener's garden, all clipped and spick and span, would you? It's nicer like this, with things running wild and swinging, catching hold of each other. Don't let us make it tidy, said Mary anxiously. It wouldn't seem like a secret garden if it was tidy. Dickon stood rubbing his rusty red head with a rather puzzled look. It's a secret garden, sure enough, he said. It seems like someone besides the robin must have been in it since it was shut up ten years ago. But the door was locked and the key was buried, said Mary. No one could get in. That's true, he answered. It's a queer place. Seems to me as if there'd been a bit of pruning done here and there, later than ten years ago. How could it have been done, said Mary. He was examining a branch of a standard rose, and he shook his head. Aye, how could it, he murmured, with the door locked and the key buried. Mistress Mary always felt that, however many years she lived, she should never forget that first morning when her garden began to grow. Of course, it did seem to begin to grow for her that morning, when Dickon began to clear places to plant seeds. She remembered what Basil had sung at her when he wanted to tease her. Are there any flowers that look like bells? she inquired. Lilies of the valley does, he answered, digging away with the trowel. And there's Canterbury bells and Campanulas. Let's plant some, said Mary. There's lilies of the valley here already. I saw them. They'll have grown too close and we'll have to separate them, but there's plenty. The other ones take two years to bloom from a seed, but I can bring you some bits of plants from our cottage garden. Why dost thou want them? Then Mary told him about Basil and his brothers and sisters in India, of how she had hated them and of their calling her Mistress Mary quite contrary. They used to dance round and sing at me. They sang, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. I just remembered it, and it made me wonder if there were really flowers like silver bells. She frowned a little and gave her trowel a rather spiteful dig into the earth. I wasn't as contrary as they were. But Dickon laughed. Hey, he said, and as he crumbled the rich black soil, she saw he was sniffing at the scent of it. Doesn't seem to be no need for no one to be contrary, when there's flowers and such like, and... Such lots of friendly wild things running about, making homes for themselves, or building nests and singing and whistling, does there? 
Mary, kneeling by him, holding the seeds, looked at him and stopped frowning. Dickon, she said. You are as nice as Martha said you were. I like you. And you make the fifth person. I never thought I should like five people. Dickon sat up on his heels as Martha did when she was polishing the grate. He did look funny and delightful, Mary thought, with his round blue eyes and red cheeks and happy-looking turned-up nose. Only five folks as thou likes, he said. Who's the other four? Your mother and Martha. Mary checked them off on her fingers. And the robin and Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon laughed so that he was obliged to stifle the sound by putting his arm over his mouth. I know that I think I'm a queer lad, he said. But I think that the queerest little lass I ever saw. Then Mary did a strange thing. She leaned forward and asked him a question she had never dreamed of asking anyone before. And she tried to ask it in Yorkshire, because that was his language. And in India, a native was always pleased if you knew his speech. Does thou like me? she said. Eh, he answered heartily. That I does. I likes thee wonderful, and so does the robin, I do believe. That's two then, said Mary. That's two for me. And then they began to work harder than ever, and more joyfully. Mary was startled and sorry when she heard the big clock in the courtyard strike the hour of her midday dinner. I shall have to go, she said mournfully. And you'll have to go too, won't you? Dickon grinned. My dinner's easy to carry about with me. Mother always lets me put a bit of something in my pocket. He picked up his coat from the grass and brought out of a pocket a lumpy little bundle tied up in a quite clean, coarse blue and white handkerchief. It held two thick pieces of bread with a slice of something laid between them. It's oftenest naught but bread, he said, but I got a fine slice of fat bacon with it today. Mary thought it looked a queer dinner, but he seemed ready to enjoy it. Run on and get thy victuals, he said. I'll be done with mine first. I'll get some more work done before I start back home. He sat down with his back against a tree. I'll call the robin up, he said, and give him the rind of the bacon to peck at. They likes a bit of fat wonderful. Mary could scare scarcely bear to leave him. Suddenly it seemed as if he might be a sort of wood fairy who might be gone when she came into the garden again. He seemed too good to be true. She went slowly halfway to the door in the wall and she stopped and went back. Whatever happens, you... you never would tell, she said. His poppy-coloured cheeks were distended with his first big bite of bread and bacon, but he managed to smile encouragingly. If thou was a mussel thrush and showed me where thy nest was, does thou think I'd tell anyone? Not me. Thou art as safe as a mussel thrush. And she was quite sure she was. And that is where we close the book tonight, as that is the end of the chapter, and a perfect place to put a pin in the secret garden for now. I think that was just the most wholesome and lovely chapter of those two in the garden together. Can't wait to see what happens next. Until next time, thank you for being here, and good night.